Thank you for joining and welcome to Lead Dev Bookmarked. Um, Lead Dev is a global community of engineering leaders who come together to discuss all things leadership, team, tools, and tech. This is our third edition of Bookmarked, uh, a monthly book club. Um, make sure to join the Lead Dev Slack workspace. We'll take some questions um, and continue the conversation there afterwards. You can find details at theleaddeveloper.com slash bookmarked. Um, I'm Susan Bond, and I'll be your moderator for this discussion. I'm a former COO of a scaling startup and an executive coach. Uh, my uh, specialty is tech leaders. Today we'll be talking um, about feedback and other dirty words with M. Tamara Chandler and Laura Dowling Grealish. Welcome to the show, you two. Thank, Thank you. you. We're the show, lucky like, third, right? Third show. <laughs> love it. <laughs> sure. Megan, like, is it a show? I'm calling it a show. I don't know. So. <laughs> Let's call it a show. <laughs> Howard Stern has a show, just like you. <laughs> I just made something up. Um, so, you know, Tamara, I'm really curious. How did the two of you um, come to write this book? What, what, the, what made you write this book? Why this book? Why now? Yeah, it's interesting because when we first told people we were going to write a book on feedback, they're like, isn't that a topic a lot of people have already covered? But, um, mm. you know, we had, uh, I had written a book called How Performance Management is Killing Performance and What to Do About It that was published uh, about five years ago. And from that book and the work that we were doing around that book, we did a lot of work, particularly in the performance management space. Mm -hmm. And no matter... Um, what organization we were working with, and every solution we design is unique and customized to that organization, we always ran into this hurdle that every great solution had an element of changing feedback or creating what we would call a true culture of feedback. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we'd hit that, every client would say, uh, but wait, we're horrible at feedback, or we don't know how to do feedback, or like every place we would go. So there was that going on, and as we started to sort of noodle on that and, and sort of peel it back, we realized the whole world has feedback wrong. It's not just our clients that we need to fix this for. It's for every human that shows up <laughs> every day wanting to do a good job, wanting to feel safe and healthy and like they can thrive in their environment. We need to fix feedback. And we realized that we've really got it all wrong. We've defined it wrong. We do it wrong, how we practice it, how we think about it. It's, so we had to fix it. So that's what got us to, we said, well, if we have to fix it, I guess the first thing we should do is think about how we do that and how we share that idea with all the people out there. Well, yeah, and, and, and I, I get that like in a bigger, broader way than just the people who hire you, a book can really reach many more people. And if you think about right. it in a broad, more broad perspective, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Doing that. So I have a quick, um, one quick thing um, you mentioned in there, and I want to make sure that we talk about, can you just define the word performance management for folks? We have a lot of engineering leaders, some who may not know the word performance uh, yeah. management and some who might just so that <laughs> we, so that, because that, that's a world I come from, but just so that we under, like we define what we mean by performance management. Sure. And, and good on those who don't know it because those that do know it <laughs> hate it. <laughs> Uh, so when I, when we're talking about that, we're talking about traditional performance management and traditional performance management is what typically includes the annual review process, maybe a semi annual review. It means we sort of bundle up a whole bunch of feedback that we dump on people annually that of course is biased by recency bias and all sorts of other things. It often includes a rating of some sort and ratings while science tells us really are, um, really not effective or accurate ratings are put into a system because they tend to drive out compensation decisions or mm -hmm. other talent decisions that organizations make. And so it sort of mechanizes a process that's very human and performance management has, is pretty ubiquitous. It's around the world, 90 yep. over 90% of organizations really did it the same for decades. And so we've been trying to sort of bust through that and get people to really change the way they think about how you motivate, develop, grow people, how you, we recognize people for the work that they're doing, how we pay them fairly and equitably. So we've kind of pulled all that apart and that's the work we've done in the performance management space. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And Just when Cameron talks yeah. about uh, writing the book differently. So that book was seminal in a lot of the work we did all over the world. And sometimes when people blow up 
their performance management system organizations uh, would we would you know encourage them don't just do an annual review get together talk give each other feedback more you know check-ins things like that and the book was really written because people would go yeah I hate doing it once a year why should I do it four times a year it's bad I'm I, I don't like talking to people so that was what really started it was like mm. why mm -hmm. do we hate that part so much and why do we fear it how can we fix it and that started the research it's like what can we do differently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So good. Yeah, that's such a great point. Thank you so much. I feel like that really rounds out sort of where feedback sits sort of in <laughs> all of all of this and its relation to performance management um, as as we as we call it. Um, and that leads to a great question. You know, another follow up, uh, Tamara, what the, um, what is a culture of feedback and why is it important? Like, how do you define a culture of feedback? Uh, I'm so happy you asked this because um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people throw those words around. Oh, we have a culture of feedback and it, mm -hmm. and it means sort of not great things. Like, you know, it means I can go around and tell everybody exactly what I think of them because we have an open feedback culture. <laughs> uh, no, that's not it. Um, wh when we're talking about a culture of feedback, we're imagining a place where feedback flows as part of our daily experience, where you almost don't even notice it's feedback because it's just the way that we work. We, we coach each other, we, we notice and witness what's happening around us, we recognize all the great work, we help people see themselves in a way that for their strengths and how you can take that forward. You know, we end a meeting with a review of how did this go, how do we get better, we just sort of integrate it into the way that we work. And so it becomes light and easy and not this sort of event or burden or thing that we hate like Laura was talking about. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the one thing that Tamara did early on, and I learned so much writing the book with her, was she said, you know what, we need a new definition. Feedback, she redefined it, and, and in the book you'll find the definition, and I hope I don't pose it, Tamara, but feedback mm -hmm. has so much of an emotional hangover and so much baggage for a lot of us who might be of a certain age and have done things this way for so long or even you know folks new in their career but feedback has to be redefined as something that helps an individual grow improve thrive and that's got to be its only purpose and the only way you can create a culture like that is if we all run at it with that definition if you're not offering feedback for the sole purpose of helping someone grow, thrive, because that's it. We believe that is uh, the, the human condition. We, we want to thrive and grow at work. We do. I, I really don't believe that there's many people out there that just want to get by, right? We want to thrive. If you're not giving feedback to help elevate someone's game, help mm -hmm. them grow uh, mm -hmm. emotionally, personally, and tech, you know, technologically, then it's really not feedback. It's probably criticism. It's probably attitude. It's probably um, conflict. Judgment. <laughs> Judgment. Yeah. I love that. It, it brings up, um, I recently wrote a, uh, a story about the worst feedback I've ever received. Ooh, tell and, us. What was it? Well, I'll tell a quick, I'll, I'll tell the yes. quick story. It was early in my career and I had a lead who, um, probably had never had any management training to be fair to them. And they took me out to lunch one day and they said, you're doing something wrong and everybody knows it. And of course my heart just went, <laughs> my stomach. And I'm like, <laughs> and my no. was, I, I, I was like panting. I'm like, okay, okay. And I'm, yes. I mean, and I'm even shaking now as I tell the story. And what they I said, oh my God, what am I doing wrong? Please tell me, I, I really want to know. And what they said was, I'm going to pull my ear when you're doing it. This is a real story. I, I am not exaggerating. And I was so like, they wouldn't tell you. They're just going to say, I'll, I'll, I'll flag you when you're doing it. Oh my and goodness. I said, wait, wait, how am I going to know what that sim? Am I oh, itching my no. nose? Am I talking too loud? And so I had to ask three or four times for them to, to tell me what that, you know, right, what, right. That, oh. what, what the feedback, what the feedback was. And, and, you know, there's like a whole bunch of that story that, that I won't tell now, but, but, 
but I also think a lot of us have had bad experiences. I'm not the only yeah. person who's had a bad that experience. Is the, that is, yes, that's the leading exercise. And all of you 68 folks that are out there, that's the leading exercise we do in these now virtual workshops where we say, you know, think about a time. And you just explained it beautifully. You told us your emotions, your you physically went through something. Right now, I'm still shaking from it. I'm like, <laughs> and how many years ago was that? That stayed yeah. with you. So Over a decade. past mm -hmm. is a ton of what we do in these workshops because that stuck with you. And if we're saying, if we could analyze that, okay, it wasn't, it, it wasn't fair, right? It was, you, you, it wasn't focused. You didn't know what it was right? It wasn't, wasn't clear. <laughs> wasn't clear. It was a judgment and you didn't really grow from it because you just, you were trying to defend yourself, right? Right. So that's exactly what we have people go through is reenact that. And now let's figure out how to get past it and how to do it differently, right? When we know better, we do better. And so I don't want to ever yeah. do that to somebody else. Right. It's it, like Laura said, if you want to get a conversation started, like if you've got a team of developers you're working with, just have a conversation 30 minutes about what's the, what is the most dramatic feedback you've received positively or negatively, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, we have learned a lot of bad habits and because those bad habits are sort of, you know, out there in our ethos, um, we all have had experiences like that that are bad. And as we start to talk about them and share them, that helps us understand and dissect them. Yeah. But the, on the flip side, yeah. if you start talking to people about what is feedback you received that really did help you thrive or grow, and, yes. and frequently, literally people will say, it changed my life. It, yes. I redirected my life. I went in a new direction. I, I learned something about myself I never knew and I've never gone back. Like, when you hear those stories, those are when people lean into you and say, I see you, you're doing something amazing, or you have a skill, or I believe in you. It's those are the stories I'm telling you, they're almost always a I believe in you kind of story yeah. that redirects someone's life. And that's where when I think of a culture of feedback, if we got a little more of that going on, like if we really were able to help say, I see you, and I see the power you have and the and where you could go that it's important to you and I'm here to help you get there. Yeah. Man, that's yeah, cool I love stuff. That. I well, love that. Yeah, I mean I think it's it's really interesting because if I think about the story that I just told, I know that that um, that that person, I also have compassion. In the end I had compassion for that person. I know they were nervous, they were struggling. And it just, you know, made me go back, you know, and think about you know, Laura, as you were talking about, like, why do we struggle with feedback so much? What, mm. what makes us struggle about it so much? Even though we understand why it's important. I think we all are clear it's important, but that, that whole thing you said in the book, like people are like, oh, but feedback, we're terrible at it. Yeah, and, and a lot of the research that we did, it really comes down to the neurobiology, right? There's a ton mm -hmm. of science out there right now that says your brain generates chemicals uh, either in, you know, to promote or to, you know, elevate fear as a protection mode. We know about the fight, flight, and flee kind of response, um, but there's a ton of research that says, you know what, there are brain chemicals, there are things in the tone of your voice and the way the human brain decides to trust in an instant whether they trust these words or not, trust you as friend or foe. And really it comes down to fear. And we can biologically change our reaction to feedback, to people's words, to certain experiences. Mm -hmm. Now that we know, and we do things like, you know, we name the emotion. You just said, Susan, you just said, you know, my heart went like this and I felt like this. And we name it and Practices, simple practices like mindfulness practice, um, the simple practice of slowing your breath, just recognizing that this is a biological reaction. You fear the feedback because you're, you're biologically wired to figure out if this is a friend or a foe, if you're supposed to trust this person or not, trust these words, trust or not. And it stuck with you. Look how long that stuck with you. Well, and so, Susan, to your, oh, sorry, Laura. I was going to jump in there to your point mm -hmm. that the person offering that 
was just in as much fearful state as you were, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. and when we were looking at it, so Laura's right, the chemicals are what's responding to to, you know, in this protection state. Our body's trying to say, I'm gonna protect you. Um, but we we also really dug into well what at the root of it, what is it that we're fearing? And the thing that we're fearing is being alienated or that loss of connection mm -hmm. or not not being part of the herd, frankly. I mean, we're yeah. still, you know, back in the days when we traveled in tribes, um, if you were rejected from the tribe, you probably died, right? Because you were like yeah. kicked out. And and there we are still these hugely social beings and we want to be accepted. We want to be part of something. And when we, whether we are offering feedback or we're receiving feedback, if we perceive it as negative, which we frequently do because we're also wired to be, as we say, positively negative, if we're perceiving it as negative, that's sending us a signal of you are not accepted. We, you, we are casting you out in some sense. And that's at the root of what we're fearing. Yeah. Well, and I, I, in my work, I work with a lot of leaders who are also, they'll tell me, we'll talk about why did they avoid feedback? And sometimes mm -hmm. they'll say to me, I'm terrified I'm gonna get it wrong. Yeah. And I'm going to mm -hmm. say something wrong. I'm going to do something wrong. Right. And that speaks so what you were saying about that fear of being cast out and, right. and, and, and the social, you know, sort of social stigma if they get it wrong and feeling like it's hard to do. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah totally. And you know, we, we uh, talk about that in the book and that is a huge fear. And I want to point out this uh, thing we call the connect model. We created kind of a conversation model for, leaders like that. And our coaching clients are the same. It's like, just tell me what to say and how to say it. And that's kind of sort of, you know, helpful, but you also, you know, have to wrap your head around the mindset and everything. But knowing that what you say, feedback is always subjective. It's your perception. It's your experience. And if we can notice, Tamara talked a little bit about the fine, fine art of noticing and share your noticing, not necessarily that it's definitive, particularly if you're talking about someone's behavior or someone's, um, like you said, presentation skills or something, all you can really share, and you'll never get it wrong if you share your truth. I experienced it like this, Susan. Mm -hmm. I noticed you were speaking too loudly and that made me react and kind of, um, I wasn't listening as clearly. I, my perception, you know, might not be uh, what other mm -hmm. people saw. So you can never get it wrong if you tell your truth and share what you noticed and, and share, you know, free of judgment. It wasn't, you're doing it all wrong, Susan. Mm -hmm. It was just a, I noticed this and that's the way it came up for me. Mm -hmm. So I think if yeah. we, we can coach each other on what did you experience and that might not be what other people experience. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point about subjectivity. Um, and there's mm -hmm. so much to be said on that. I want to um, take us to a, a little bit of a different place that I think is related. Um, and I'm curious for the both of you, um, like what's the biggest myth about feedback or it put another way, what, if you wanted people to know one thing about feedback, what would that be? And I'd love for each of you, you know, to share with me your thoughts. Uh, I, this is always mine. Um, the biggest myth mm -hmm. about feedback is the idea that with the way we help someone throw, thrive, grow, or advance, as Laura was speaking earlier to our definition, is by telling them what they're doing wrong or what needs to be <sighs> improved. And the, the science behind this is very clear. Um, you know, Marcus Buckingham, if you're any of you are fans of him, you know, has written about strengths forever. And the research behind it is very, very solid. The yep. best way we help people thrive, grow, and advance is to lean into their strengths and help them see their strengths and to encourage and to recognize progress and to focus on, um, you know, what some people might think of as positive feedback. If we lean into the positive far more with a much more frequency, focus, and clarity, um, there is, that's where the power is. And I think that all the, a lot of this fear goes away if we realize, wow, well, this can be a lot more about the goodness and a lot less about the badness. Because unless someone is literally like, you know, on a road that they're just like heading for a cliff, 
most of the time there isn't something so dramatic that we have to like jump in front of them and say you're about to run off a cliff right most of the time it's small things that we're working with day to day but and so if we lean into the positive that also builds our trust and then when there is something that's a little harder we have that trust and we have a platform by which we can have that conversation so i think just positive uh, and reinforcing people's strengths is the most amazing feedback people can give. Mm. And Laura, how about you? Um, you know, for me, I think I would flip it to the receivers. And yes, Tamara's is my favorite myth too, but uh, I would take it from the perspective of, we talk about three roles, the uh, seeker and the extender of feedback and then the receiver. So for mm -hmm. receiver, when I'm in my receiver self, I'm the person out there. I think the biggest myth out there, well, two really is, one is that I should sit around and wait for somebody to give it to me. Our challenge to everyone yeah. is be, get out there and be a seeker of feedback, ask for someone's perspective, advice, et cetera. Don't wait around for your, you know, for your lead to give you feedback. You own it, you own your career, you own your thriving, particularly now when we're, we're so separated, you know, you've got to get out there and, uh, don't wait around. I think the saddest thing I hear is when someone says, I'm leaving the organization because I just didn't get any feedback. And, mm -hmm. you know, we often say, did you ask for any? Mm -hmm. So I think that, and then um, that as a receiver, you know, perspectives that challenge our thinking are really the ones that teach us the most. So if you can get into that mindset of not prove, I got to prove that I'm right. I've got to prove that I'm good, but that, if you can kind of embody this, I can improve, right? The growth mindset that the, the point of feedback for the receiver is not to really affirm your own belief in your goodness, but maybe to help you evolve your beliefs a little bit. And so for the receiver to be that, you know, notice what's coming up for you. Notice what you can be changing or evolving and, and don't get into that defensive mode where the fear is running hot in your blood, you know. I think it's really important to um, also to mention, we have a lot of um, managers, leaders here, and that as a manager, a leader, any sort of person in, in a role, uh, you know, we're, we need to also be open to getting feedback mm -hmm. as well. And that, that, that feedback is both, can be both ways. So I think that is wonderful. Yeah. And we, 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 we're, we, every, in the section, in each of the extenders, receivers, and um, seekers, we talk about leaders going first, and particularly because we think start with seeking. So as a leader, how do you start? And you can even do that in super easy ways. Like I was saying, you, you finish a team meeting and you ask for one you know, specific piece of feedback on how the agenda went, or you know, what are the things you can start to ask for that are light and easy, but start to build some of those muscles. And then over time, you, you, you have more strength in your, in your team around feedback. And so leaders getting out there and seeking first, whether that's how we're working or how something I'm doing is helping or not. And, you know, we, we use a lot of like kick some ask in, in the book is one of our key sayings, kick some ask and just get out there. And as a leader, even just asking, what is it that your people care about? What do they want feedback on? What are they trying to achieve? You know, we say it's their career, not your agenda. So what can you be helping them with? And the more that leaders get out and ask, and then again, that brings the fear down because now I know I'm providing you insights on something that is important to you, right? Yeah. You're trying to make this career move. You're trying to build this skill. You're trying, you know, what is it you're trying to do? And how do I as a leader help you do that? And those are the leaders that, you know, have highly engaged teams and um, mm -hmm. really organized groups that thrive. Yeah. Yeah. And we even had some new researchers the other day that said, you know, asking for advice a leader who asks for advice or asks someone they typically wouldn't ask of you know sometimes as leaders we're really afraid to um admit we don't know it all so why would <laughs> i ask my team member for advice it's a yep. really growth mindset move to ask different people and ask others that work for you you know how would you do it differently and, and not in a defensive way you know what might work better for you and me but getting in that mode of asking so that then they feel free to ask others about themselves and stuff, right? The, then people start seeking feedback 
and it creates that culture Tamara was talking about. Mm, yeah, re that, re that really strikes me. Um, what are, um, and we're talking a lot about feedback right now, and I think, Laura, you mentioned this earlier. What are your, the three Fs of feedback? Can you tell us what they are and maybe give us a quick example? I can, and I think we only have two minutes, so you'll have to read the book. But oh um, we, yeah, we're yeah we've got a couple more minutes. We're we okay. okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, yep. I'm making my, uh, when we wrote the book, uh, first of all, we titled it something different. We called it the F word, right? We wanted it to be funny and mm. the F word, the F bomb, something like that. And the publisher said no, but we stayed on that theme, feedback and other dirty words, and. When we were doing the research, we're like, okay, how can we keep it kind of pithy and fun? But you know what? The three F's that really make feedback uh, cultures thrive are this, right? Frequency. Don't wait around for the annual review. Keep it as part of your ongoing conversation, conversational intelligence. Keep it positive too. You know, positive and recognition is feedback. Keep it coming. Frequency, fairness. There's a ton we can talk about, about bias, about mm. keeping your own perspective rather than presenting that as fact. Um, frequency, fairness, and focus are our Fs. And focus is, again, keep it bite-sized. The brain can only keep this much, not a giant regurgitation. Focused on the actual issue, you know, focus on one thing, and then there's another F in the book, too, that we call the fine art of noticing. And that's really this um, present moment awareness, not only for the receiver, but the giver of, of really noticing what's happening right now in the moment. Keep it factual. Um, everything from, you know, being mindful and not judgmental. So there's a lot of stuff in those Fs. So I would definitely <laughs> check out those chapters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that idea of one thing, you know, light and easy, it ties back to what I was saying before. If we can shift our heads away from the idea that feedback is, you know, we sit in a room with a box of Kleenexes in the middle of the table and we have this big, heavy conversation and we can think of it much more as, as, you know, Laura, you did a great job during the presentation today. I love the, you know, the way you answered this question. The more that we just kind of reinforce and get specific and it's just one thing. And then, you know, it, when it is one thing, as Laura was take, talking about, one of the, my favorite lines is feedback, short reflection, long. So again, as a receiver, sometimes somebody will drop a tiny little nugget on you. It's not even, they don't even think of it as feedback. They just notice something, right? I, I had that situation where uh, one of my colleagues, uh, we were working on the project and said, I haven't seen you this happy in ages. And suddenly it dawned on me that the work I was doing was the work I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And she had just said that casually, she was packing up her, computer bag and walking out the door but that I reflected on that for months and then mm -hmm. did change my life so you know I think that that light and easy one thing that focus that's you know focus and frequency light easy frequent well yeah, and I want to do two last quick questions here and I I, I want to talk about um, one that when we think about like models are great like the three apps it's so great to have models and one that's been out there a lot is the crap sandwich. I'm not going to swear. We all know it's a different word, but the crap sandwich. And and, and, and people talk about it a, a, a lot. And I'm curious to hear what's the danger of the crap sandwich and, and what should what should managers do instead? I'm trying not to swear. <laughs> Susan, and you shared with us that in this environment, in the developer world, that sometimes it is, and we know people were taught to do that. And when we're talking about the crap sandwich, all y'all, if you don't know what it is, it's that you know, it's that butter them up, say something nice, slide in the tough piece of feedback and then back off with a little, well, your hair looks pretty today, <laughs> you know? Mm. And if you look at any of the neuroscience or the three Fs, right? Why isn't that okay? Isn't it okay to get this person to kind of trust me and settle in so I can really tell them what I wanted to say? No, it's not fair. Okay? Your mind is being whipsawed. Your brain is like, oh, he really loves me. Oh, whoa. We, we grab onto the negative quicker than we grab onto the positive. So even if the two positive, the bread's heart, were real for you, you know what? Your mind won't grab onto those. It's not fair. Yeah. It's not focused, right? Yeah. And it truly is a trust buster. 
I don't know which way she's going to come at me. It's a mixed message and it's confusing. If there's something I'm doing, don't pull your damn ear. Tell me what it is. <laughs> I can fix that. And then I can move forward. I'm a, I'm a great big adult. Wow. You know, you were talking too loud on that uh, today, Laura. It, it came across too loud. Turn your volume up. Easy to fix. Not, you looked really pretty, but you were talking too loud. And then you, so it's just not, it's not fair. It's not focused. And it's a trust buster. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it, it's in some ways what I hear too is uh, coming more directly with those three F's is more effective than this trying to sandwich something. Yeah. Trying to make it go down a little bit smoother. It doesn't make that sandwich taste any better when you butter it up with two compliments on either side. And like Laura yeah. says, the big issue is the trust because now I, I don't really trust those two nice things you said were real. You just said them to to make that sandwich try to taste a little better. So the next time you come at me with something that's nice, I'm still not sure I'm even going to trust it, right? I'm just, are you just like warming me up for something else that's coming, right? The whole right, trust right. thing just falls apart. Well, yeah. it goes back, but, I think, so sometimes what you the said. Managers, oh, sorry. Sometimes the managers will say, well, what if they are real? And then, you know, Tamara's real good about saying, good. Then say the good stuff often, often, all the time. Right. Make that your one thing. Don't wait till you have something tough to tell them. You always be saying the good stuff, yes. And then, you know what? The trust is there. This person uh, has my best interest at heart. And gosh, now she's going to tell me something a little bit tough. I get it. She's probably right. Well, yeah, and I, I think what I was going to say too, um, Tamara, is it goes back to what you were saying earlier about positive feedback. And I think that changes the face of it and makes, like you said, makes people trust the positive feedback less. And right. that doesn't really help create a full culture of feedback. So there's some really right. important things in there that I, I, I know that's a really specific, um, I mean, in the book, it's a small example, but I thought, well, I hear about that a lot. People will ask me, people right. when they work with me, will ask me, say, oh, do you believe in the crap sandwich? And I would say, first I said, I don't even know what that is. But then I said, oh, no, I, I don't believe in it. But <laughs> the, I thought that was so good the way that you two yeah. spoke about that in the book and why that was important. Not too yeah. tasty. You can not say too not tasty. tasty. <laughs> not too tasty. <laughs> well, and you know, the interesting things, even on positive, when we, when as a receiver of positive feedback, we are horrible at taking it in. We're horrible at accepting it. Um, you know, yes. that idea of feedback short uh, reflection long, you know, we tend to positive feedback, we drop it quickly. It's like comes in, it goes out, right? We don't yeah. savor it. Someone says yeah. some little negative thing or something that it, we perceived as negative, we savor it for days or weeks or whatever, Thinking about right? It. Yeah, so we, yeah. one of the habits we really have to work on is, is A, not taking that, uh, taking something and making it just, you know, hurt us but also thinking about how do we let the goodness help us right mm. and um it's hard to do mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah i i yeah i love i i love that it happens all the time and with my clients too i'll say something positive and or i'll say well let's talk about what right no what that's a bad place to look why would i want to go there and right, it's right. actually a practice a practice that i actively work on and i tell my i'll tell my folks work on that as a as a leader accepting the positive too because it will also change the way that you give feedback to other people as well and the way right. you think about it so it's oh, such totally. a great such a great point. Okay, last question. I could talk to you too all day about this. <laughs> yes, um, so my last question is, um, I think for Tamara, you know, feedback I think is more important than ever right now, given the environment where, like we talked about earlier, that we're, you know, there's many more work from home um, folks and, and, and companies are increasingly working for work from home for indefinite. What are a couple things leaders need to be um, more aware of in that um, newly distributed work environment? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, we talk a lot in the book about connection and the more frequently mm -hmm. we connect, the more that we can build trust. And what we kind of, what's easy to forget is when we're in a physically, you know, shared space, we connect in an informal sort of unplanned way very easily. And that helps us build our relationships and our trust. And so we have to think about more consciously how we replace those sort of casual conversations and connections, but mm -hmm. also be very, uh, sometimes prescriptive. I would encourage leaders to mm -hmm. set times with their folks that is just a 
you know, check in, how are you doing? What are you working on? Is there something, you know, you, you talked about this book club. I think a lot of people are trying to like, can I exit this process, this crisis smarter? Can I exit it better in some way? You know, I'm losing some things, what can I gain? And I think having that conversation, you know, what, what do they want to gain through this process? And how is you as a leader can help them do that? Uh, give them project experience or learning time or, you know, whatever that is or or even you know some people are having a lot of you know mental health challenges through this because of yeah. the stress and that and just tuning into how are you doing are you okay you know what do you need um i'm here i'm here to help and i think just taking that time to connect and then of course i have to end with and and making sure you're noticing the goodness that is happening while people are working remotely and calling that out and recognizing people for showing up. And most people are working harder now. They're working longer hours. Like, how do you really thank people and call out all the goodness you're seeing? Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, yeah. Amen, thank sister. You so, yeah, thank you so much. You two <laughs> were so her. fun. Um, thank you. Her. Thank you, everyone, for watching the interview. Um, you can join the discussion on the Bookmark channel on Slack. Um, Laura and Tamara will be there to answer questions. Um, I'll also be there as well, but they're going to be answering your questions. Um, as a reminder, Lead Dev Bookmark is a monthly book club. Next month, we're going to be speaking with um, James Stanier on becoming an effective software engineer manager. Thanks again. See you all next month. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Susan. Thanks, Susan.